In this video, we will talk about the two common phenotypes of motor control patterns we see in patients with low back pain and how you should adapt your management to the respective type. Is it enough to just increase activities like recommended in most guidelines? Or is it important how patients with low back pain move? Enroll in our online course now. Link is in the video description. Hi and welcome back to PhysioTutors. In an earlier video, we talked about the work of Hodges et al, who present a new theory about movement changes that occur when people are in pain. This video will discuss Hodges' follow-up paper from 2015 and shows how we might be able to target these movement changes in rehab. Movement changes in pain across a spectrum from subtle changes in muscle coordination to complete avoidance of a function with varying impacts on activity and participation and potentially important implications for the selection of treatments that involve movement. While these changes are potentially beneficial in the short term to protect the painful or injured body part, motor adaption can persist beyond when it is necessary. There are several possibilities why this is the case. The nervous system may fail to return to its pre-injury state as the removal of pain might not be enough for movement recovery. Although the nervous system has a refined capacity to respond and adapt to immediate feedback such as pain provocation, there is limited potential to predict and adjust to long-term outcomes such as the potential consequences of maintenance of a suboptimal strategy. Ongoing anticipation, threat or fear of potential pain and or injury may motivate the maintenance of the adapted strategy. For example, fear of pain maintains absence of trunk extensor muscle relaxation during flexion. Central or peripheral sensitization render the link between motor adaption and the pain experience less clear with neither maintenance of the adaption nor its recovery directly related to pain. The modified motor behavior could lead to secondary biomechanical or neurophysiological changes that prevent return to pre-pain state. This could be the case in atrophy, fatty infiltrations of the multifidi in low back pain, muscle length, stiffness changes, and increased or decreased muscle strength. If motor adaptions persist, they may become part of the problem for the primary involved tissues or could be responsible for the establishment of secondary changes and sources of nociception. It's important to consider that the mechanism for persistence of pain may differ from the mechanism that initiated the pain. Although biomechanics may underpin the onset of nociceptive input and pain, ongoing biomechanical issues could mediate maintenance of nociceptive pain. Other cognitive and biological processes may also be responsible. And each requires a different treatment approach. Treatments that focus on physical activity and exercise are the cornerstone of management of many pain conditions, but the effect sizes are only modest. The effectiveness of active treatments is likely to depend on the individual and are unlikely to be optimal if implemented in a generic manner without the consideration of the individual. When we look at research regarding motor control in patients with low back pain, We've come a long way from what we've called lumbar instability with stereotypical inhibition of the transverse abdominis and multifidi. Van Dyen et al. in the year 2019 suggests that there are two phenotypes at the two ends of distributions, namely one with tight control over trunk movement and the other one with loose control. The tight control pattern implies increased trunk stiffness through co-contraction and reflex gains in order to achieve constraint of movement with the object to avoid nociception, pain or injury or in anticipation of such threats. Such a strategy would also be expected to reduce variation in movement. Tight control can be subtle with slightly higher activation within a region of a muscle up to complete avoidance of a task or function on the other end. While probably beneficial in the short term as a protective mechanism, 
It comes at the cost of increased spinal loading, impaired water reuptake in the intervertebral discs, decreased dampening to counteract perturbations and muscle fatigue. Reduced motor variability decreases the possibility of the body to share loads between different structures across repetitions. For example, if I hit a nail with a hammer a hundred times, no swing will be exactly the same and joint angles and muscle activation will slightly differ with every stroke. Now if I keep my elbow extended for example, like in a lumbar spine, that doesn't want to bend, I will clearly limit my possibilities of variation and thus load certain structures more regularly. The loose control pattern involves reduced muscle excitability and usually avoids high tissue loading at the cost of a loose control over movement. If muscular control over spine movement is reduced by inhibition and associated with delays in response to perturbation, this may lead to fast and larger amplitude movements with more variability between repeated performance of the same task. So at the other end, too much variability might reflect uncontrolled motion. If muscular control over the spine fails, mid-range and also sustained end-range alignment of the lumbar vertebral segments through creep may be compromised. Loading the tissues could lead to tissue strains and potentially pain. Looking at these two phenotypes, it seems logical that different interventions are likely to be required to address these different presentations of changes in motor control. For the tight group, the targets for intervention should be to reduce co-contraction, increase movement and potentially movement variation. In case of movement avoidance, it makes sense to evaluate unhelpful beliefs, fear and catastrophic thoughts and to tackle them by education, reassurance and a graded exposure program. For the loose control group, on the other hand, interventions should target to increase muscle function and to decrease variability, probably starting with low load motor control exercises, progressing to high load exercises. At last, there are a couple of challenges we haven't addressed yet. Be aware that these two phenotypes are at the extreme ends of a spectrum and there are patients with no or no obvious changes of motor control. For them, interventions of motor control might not be beneficial or necessary, but this group might be exactly the one that is perfectly fine with a graded activity approach without any focus on motor control. At last, it has to be said that changes of motor control are always dependent on the task to be performed. Changes might be observed with one task, but not with another. A limitation we currently face is that we don't have a reliable assessment battery yet to categorize patients into either tight control pattern or loose control pattern. Alright, this was our video on the two typical phenotypes for motor control in low back pain. Let us know if you like this video by giving it a thumbs up down below and if you want to know how to assess and treat these kinds of patients, subscribe for our online course on the spine on study.physiotutors.com. Thanks a lot for watching, I'll see you in another video, bye.